you haven't already done so, please uh, take your Bibles and join me in Genesis chapter 2. We did it. We got through a whole chapter. Um, but we're only going to get through three verses this morning. So not really picking up the pace too much. Genesis 2, looking at verses 1 to 3, probably page 2 on, in the, the blue ESV Bibles out there. Uh, and the, the title of our sermon this morning is The Seventh Day. So one chapter and one week we've made it through so far in our working through Genesis. But it's good. Um, I'll set it up this way. Um, Abraham Joshua Heschel was professor of ethics and mysticism at the Jewish Theological Seminary of America. He was known internationally as a scholar, author, activist, and theologian, uh, all this before his death in 1972. Uh, he's got a book on the Sabbath, and he tells um, a story, a very short story in that book about a man taking a stroll through his vineyard on the Sabbath day. Heschel writes, he saw a breach in the fence and then determined to mend it when the Sabbath would be over. At the expiration of the Sabbath, he decided, since the thought of repairing the fence had occurred to me on the Sabbath, I shall never repair it. Now, I actually think Heschel makes some really interesting, even at times helpful observations about work and rest, technology, civilization, and the Sabbath in that book. But this illustration that he gives of this man that he deems quite pious, it's, it's uh, in, in the man's effort to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, I think it's actually a good example of how we tend to forget that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Jesus is quite clear about this in Mark chapter 2. So we need to look at this seventh day because it is quite important in the life of um, God's people from here on in through Scripture and even today. Genesis 2, this these first three verses anyway, bring about a conclusion uh, to the narrative that was begun in Genesis 1. Uh, you probably know this, um, but in case you don't, I'll mention it here that the chapter divisions in the Bible are not original to the text. They were added later most of the time. They're very helpful for locating passages of Scripture. But sometimes uh, the, the chapter and verse divisions are a little unhelpful, confusing, because they seemingly divide things that ought not be divided. And so it is here in Genesis 2. It's a bit uh, unfortunate there's a chapter break placed here because we need to, to make sure to grasp that what is written in these first three verses in particular is, is very closely tied, intricately connected with the preceding passage, all that has taken place in Genesis 1. And so this is really not the introduction of any kind of new thought, but it is the conclusion of the, the narrative that has been going on in all of Genesis 1. And so let me read these three verses, and then I will uh, outline the sermon, and then we'll get to work on it. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Three things that I want you to see with me this morning from this passage. Um, first, we'll consider... Um, how this passage describes the result of God's creative activity that had been taking place in the previous chapter. Essentially, we see that in the completion of the heavens and the earth. And then second, we'll see God rest triumphantly over this newly created order. And third, God demonstrates His sovereignty not only over space, but also over time. 
by blessing and sanctifying the seventh day. So, first things first, then in verse 1, uh, we see the heavens, the earth, and all the hosts of them have been established. Genesis 2 opens by stating, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the hosts of them. Now, one point that I have sought to, to make at various times over the past several weeks as we've explored the opening chapter of Genesis is that while many of today's readers are particularly interested in the what and how questions that come to mind when Genesis 1 and 2 are read, the text itself is much more interested in answering the who and the why questions. Now, what and how aren't bad questions to ask of Genesis 1, but they aren't the questions that we should ask first. They're not the questions that Genesis 1 is primarily interested in answering. What I mean by all of this is that Genesis 1 and 2, it is a thoroughly religious text before it is a scientific one. That doesn't mean that it's anti-scientific, even less that it's anti-historical, but we must grapple with the religious nature of the opening chapters of Genesis with the rest of Genesis and the rest of the Bible, but we must grapple with this if we are to understand them correctly. Another way to say this is that Genesis 1 functions liturgically to help God's people worship Him rightly. Liturgy is just your form of public worship, and, and so Genesis 1 helps us to worship. It helps us to understand who God is and what is this place in which we are called to worship. And so how does Genesis 2-1 fit within the design laid out in the opening chapters, or the opening chapter of Genesis? Well, again, it brings to a conclusion this thought Genesis 1 was teaching the ancient Israelites that theirs was the one true and living God who brought about the universe. He brought it into existence. He lavished provisions upon his creatures and this world, and he alone deserves to be worshipped. The Israelites would have been familiar with various creation myths and origin stories that circulated in the ancient Near East from other pagan or from pagan uh, cults and their worship of their own false gods and deities. Well, Genesis 1, as we've said, demolishes those stories and it sets up the, the one true story, the one true narrative, the one true myth even that, that norms all the others. And so Genesis 2.1 tells us this God who set about the work of creating the world has brought it to completion and fulfillment. He finished what he set out to do in Genesis 1.1. Now, in saying that the heavens and the earth were finished, and as we'll see in verse 2, that God's work was finished, we need to ask a question. Well, what does that mean exactly, that they were finished or that God's work was finished? Did he stop doing everything altogether? We're talking specifically, of course, about God's work of creation. And here we're helped by by dividing God's work into two broad categories, creation and providence. Hebrews 1 holds these two concepts together without blurring the distinction between them. Hebrews 1 tells us God created the world through His Son, who is the radiance and glory and exact imprint of His nature, and who upholds the universe by the word of His power. By His word, God created the world, past tense, and now by His word, His, His word He upholds the world, present tense. And so God did not cease from all activity here in Genesis 2, but simply his creative activity by which he brought about the habitable universe, he brought it into existence, and by which he began to bring it into order. The way in which Genesis 1 describes this creation week is remarkable. Specifically thinking about God's activity in 
this week. God simply spoke and the universe came to be. God is central in this passage that concludes here in Genesis 2. And, and so the, the, the undeniable intent of this passage is to answer this question, who is God? Now, of course, there's much more Scripture to follow, so it doesn't tell us everything we need to know about God, but it does tell us something very important about where we need to begin. What kind of God created the world? And so when we look at God who sets out to create the universe and then does so, according to verse 1, He has formed and filled it. Are we struck, brothers and sisters, are you struck by the might and the power and the majesty and the mystery of God who through a spoken word brought all things into existence? He brought about the universe He intended to create. The work is done. The darkness has been overcome. The structureless plane has been formed. The empty void has been filled. And as we saw last week, He has set His image bearers, His representatives in the earth to image Him, to reflect Him, to imitate Him, and to exercise dominion and subdue the earth, bringing every square inch of it into perfect order. And so this passage opens up by bringing to a close this creative work of God to form the world. But consider with me then what it says in verse 2 where God takes rest. There's something We get confused about, perhaps, when we hear this word rest. What do you think of when you hear the word rest? A nap, perhaps? Inactivity? Was God tired from His creative work? In fact, the Quran even seems to suggest so, and it takes a a mocking swipe at Yahweh in Surat 50.38. We created the heavens and earth and all that lies between them in six spans, and no weariness came upon us. Yet nothing could be further from the truth. God doesn't get tired. right? We just noted how easy the work of creation was for the Lord, according to Genesis 1. Furthermore, furthermore, we have texts like Isaiah 40, 28 that, that affirm explicitly The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. So what's going on here in Genesis 2? Why does God rest? Genesis 2.2 says that God finished His work and rested. And this is what will help us. We've said this a few times in Genesis 1. What was God doing when He built the world? Well, he built a temple. God was building a temple in creating the world. And so having finished building that temple, God takes his kingly repose in order to delight in the work that he had finished. Several texts are worth mentioning here that draw together these themes of God and creation and temple and kingship and rest. And it will set us up nicely for considering this verse in Genesis 2. Two, Isaiah 66, 1. Isaiah says, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? Psalm 32 tells us, Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool, for the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. These texts simply explicate the truth contained in Genesis 1 and 2. In creating the world, God was building a temple, a house for himself, where he might dwell with his people in the splendor of holiness. Greg Beale, in his book, The Temple and the Church's uh, Mission, He convincingly argues that Israel's temple was composed of three main parts, each 
part symbolizing a part of the cosmos, the outer court, the holy of holy place and the holy of holies, each representing these uh, this uh, scene of of earth. And we'll see this more as well when we get into Genesis further into Genesis two. Um, if you compare Genesis. 1 and 2 with Exodus 40, you also begin to see the similarities between the world and the tabernacle. In both passages, we find repetitions of sets of seven. We find separations and fillings. We find food, in particular grain. There's light and light bearers. The building of the temple by Solomon is similar as well. We've, we've previously spoken about Psalm 78, which explicitly states that God built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth on which he, fa- or which he founded from eternity. God made the world so there might be a suitable dwelling place for himself and for man. And now, as we look at the seventh day of creation, this is brought to bear in this language of rest. This rest is not mere inactivity, but it is delight in well-won order. The world was dark, formless, and void. And so God overcame the darkness, the formlessness, the emptiness. There was chaos in the original act of creation that God purposefully took six days to bring into order. And He has now done so and takes His seat in a newly now ordered universe as King. John Walton comments, he says, The role of the temple in the ancient world is not primarily a place for people to gather and worship like modern churches. It is a place for the deity. It is sacred space. It is his home, but more importantly, his headquarters, the control room. When the deity rests in the temple, it means that he is taking command, that he is mounting to his throne to assume his rightful place and proper role. And so again, we ask, What kind of God is God? He is the kind of God who delights in what He does. When it comes to Sabbath day worship, we come to recognize that God is God, that God is King. He is the sovereign Lord. He is the ruler of the cosmos. And so God doesn't take a nap on the seventh day, but he is crowned as king on the seventh day as he comes to take his residence in his temple, his palace, his home. He is the Lord of created space, and he he is the rightful authority in the universe. That is what this tells us in Genesis 2 when God rests. And a brief point of, of, of uh, application, creation as, as temple. When we think of the world as a temple, it helps us to recognize the importance and value of work done in the world. Since the world is a temple, then even, quote, secular work is valuable and image bearers should engage in it. And so be joyful with the work that you have because you're doing it in God's world, which is reflective of His temple. Well, a a third thing to see here from verse 3 is that God blessed and sanctified this seventh day. This seventh day is blessed and sanctified as a result of God's rest. There's a, an interesting threefold blessing that occurs in Genesis 1 and 2 that we should mention here. In, in 1, 21 and 22, we're told that God blessed the, the sea monsters and the birds of the heavens for the purpose of productive fruitfulness. In verse 28, he blesses man and the woman for the pur- purpose of productive fruitfulness. And now in chapter 2, verse 3, the week of creation concludes 
with this blessing of the seventh day. This blessing in light of God's own secession from productive fruitfulness, in a sense. Genesis, if nothing else, tells us that God makes promises and He keeps those promises. That God blesses and works to bring about what He has promised to His people. God is generous with His blessings. In Genesis 1, He particularly blessed space. He blessed the animals and man. He blessed them for the purpose of fruitfulness aimed at filling the earth with creatures, his image bearers, and non-image bearers. But here in Genesis 2-3, he blesses not space, but time. I mentioned Abraham Heschel earlier a bit critically, but I want to quote him here a bit favorably now. He says, To understand the teaching of the Bible, one must accept its premise that time has a meaning for life which is at least equal to that of space. That time has a significant sovereignty of its own. So much of the ancient mind would have been devoted to and focused on space. God had been building a sacred space for himself in Genesis chapter 1. As we'll see a bit in Genesis 2 and then uh, verses to come, a, a holy mountain where he would establish his sanctuary. But here in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, these expectations are subverted a bit. It's not space that God sanctifies here, but time. The meaning of the Sabbath, back to Heschel, he says, is to celebrate time rather than space. Six days a week, we live under the tyranny of things, of space. On the Sabbath, we try to become attuned to holiness in time. It is a day on which we are called to share in what is eternal in time, to turn from the results of creation to the mystery of creation, from the world of creation to the creation of the world. There's the song, all right? Everybody is working for the weekend. If we reframed that song, lyric a bit, I think God does not give us the Sabbath for the sake of the work week, but He gave us the work week for the sake of the Sabbath. The Sabbath doesn't exist merely to enhance our efficiency through the week. One more thing from, from Heschel that I found helpful. He says, labor is a craft, but perfect rest is an art. It is a result of an accord of body, mind, and imagination. To attain a degree of excellence in art, one must accept its discipline. One must adjure slothfulness. The seventh day is a palace in time which we build. It is made of soul, of joy, of reticence. In its atmosphere, a discipline is a reminder of adjacency to eternity. And it's that phrase there that I find so helpful. Now, as I, I mentioned, I think Heschel ultimately goes wrong in the way that he understands the Sabbath and God's law and, and how it all is to work out. Perhaps we might say falling short, failing to enter fully into the blessing of the Sabbath. Certainly, without Christ, that is where we all go. But to think of the, the weekly Sabbath as a reminder of the adjacency of eternity. Every week, we are given a gift, a reminder that this life is a temporary one, that all of the, the things that we are so bothered by, so worried about, so concerned with, so many of them are so fleeting. Do you think about that one day in seven for you? Is that a gift to remember eternity? Or is it just another day to get stuff done? Or is it just another day to spend on yourself? We read Isaiah 58 for the call to worship. I'll read it again here. If you turn your foot back from the Sabbath, 
from doing your pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable. If you honor it, not going your own ways or seeking your own pleasure or talking idly, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride on the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What does this tell us? It tells us that God, in blessing and sanctifying the seventh day, does not do it merely for himself. God rests on the seventh day, and he blesses it and sanctifies it and invites humanity to join him in this rest. You may have noticed that this text about the seventh day omits a phrase that it included regarding all the other days. The phrase, there was evening and there was morning, the blank day, whatever day, first, second, third, fourth. Now, that phrase is used in connection with the other days. It's not used here in connection with the seventh. And there's lots of things that people have said about this. But I think a very simple point to make about it is that, in short, there, is, there was, at this point a perpetual invitation to mankind to enter into the divine rest that God had established on this seventh day. Now, of course, you know that Adam fails to enter that rest, and so does Israel continually after that. And so when we come to the Sabbath, thinking about it after man's fall into sin— it becomes a time to reflect, not just looking back to what God has done previously in creation, but for Israel to look forward to the God-man who, in whom we would find the full and final meaning of, of God's Sabbath. So they look back on what God had done. They look forward to what He would do, and much the same for us. We're on this side of the cross, but the Sabbath is an opportunity for us to look back on redemptive history at all that God has done in Christ and to look forward to what He will do in Christ when He rights all the wrongs. So we're invited to enter into God's rest. Hebrews tells us several, uh, makes several allusions to the Old Testament, to the Psalms. It, set forth, it sets forth this invitation. And so how do we do this? How do we enter into God's rest? By looking to Jesus, the founder and the perfecter of our faith. According to Hebrews 12, it is only by looking to Jesus that we can avoid growing weary. Jesus says in Matthew 11, Come unto me and I will give you rest. So my friend, are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Are you weighed down by the cares and concerns of this world? Jesus offers rest. Jesus is rest. He says, come to me for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, let's draw a, a few lessons together from this. Genesis 2 never explicitly describes this seventh day um, as a Sabbath. It doesn't command anything here explicitly. God rests in Genesis 2, and He blesses and sanctifies it, but there's no command given. But we, are, we do see commands later that build upon this. Exodus 20, for instance. We've seen Exodus 20 already in this series. Exodus 20 sets the Sabbath day forward as a command, explicitly in the Decalogue, saying that Israel was to remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. They were to work six days a week, and on the seventh they were to rest from their later labors. And the stated reason for this is that God created the world in six days, and he rested on the seventh. And so Exodus 20 explicitly ties God's work uh, of creating the world in six days and his rest on the seventh ties that to the command given explicitly later for us to do the same. But I also want to think about Deuteronomy 5 with you for a moment because Deuteronomy 5 also gives a Sabbath command 
in the context of the Decalogue. But it gives a different reason for why Israel was to work six and rest one, that of redemption. Deuteronomy 5 says, You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and there the Lord your God brought you out uh, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. And so for Israel, the Sabbath had a twofold significance. It was significant for them both because they were humans made in His image, and God had kindly given them a day each week to cease from their labors, to repose as kings in the world, enjoying the fruit of their labors with God. But God also gives them the Sabbath that it might serve to remind them of His work of redemption that He had accomplished for them in the Exodus. Sabbath rest in a now fallen world has to involve both uh, chaos brought into order and victory over actual enemies. Think about it. How would this sound? How would Genesis 2 sound in the ears of the Egyptians, uh, in the ears of the Israelites, as they had been slaves to the Egyptians for almost for 400 years? Had they been given great Sabbath rest by their pagan overlords? It's quite doubtful. Without pressing the analogy too far and missing the point entirely, it's worth noting that God's gift of the Sabbath serves to protect us from slavery. Now, we may not be slaves in the exact way that the uh, Israelites were to the Egyptians, although things like income and property taxes about get us there. The truth is that the gift of a weekly day of rest enables us to stay above the fray, to not just become worker drones. And so it's a great gift to us as we think about what God has done for us, not only in creating us, but also in redeeming us. And so speaking of redemption, a, a, a last thing to consider here. The seventh day of creation prepares us for what God is doing in the new creation. Twice in Genesis 2, we find the word finished. The heavens and the earth were finished, and on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. I wonder if that makes you think of anything. John, the gospel writer, you'll remember, frames his gospel in the, in the language of creation. He opens it up, referencing Genesis 1. In the beginning, he says, was the Word who brought all things into existence and who made his dwelling among us. So he's got creation on the brain, John does. But introducing us to Christ, he's got new creation on the brain. And so how does John describe the incarnate Word and his work of new creation? Well, in John 19.30, we read about Jesus on the cross. What does Jesus say? When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, what? It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Earlier in John 11, the disciples had mistook Jesus' words about the death of Lazarus to mean that Lazarus was simply resting, that he was asleep. Jesus had, in fact, said Lazarus was asleep, by which, of course, he meant that he had died. And so death and sleep and rest are related concepts in our minds. They're related in Scripture itself. Jesus finished his work, in other words, and rested. Paul comments on this whole scene in Ephesians 1, turning specifically from the death of Christ to his resurrection. He describes the power of God that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church. 
Paul ties together in this passage the work of God and the seeding of Christ and his reception of dominion over all things. Weaving in there a quote from Psalm 8. You have put, or you have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. So when Christ takes his seat in Ephesians 1, it's the same image that we have of God taking his seat, his rest, in Genesis 2. God takes his seat after his work of creation. The incarnate word takes his seat after his work of new creation. It's the same thing. Now, I've largely left something unsaid that I'll briefly mention here regarding the seventh day and the first day, Saturday and Sunday. Um, Jesus transformed the Sabbath in that prior to his death and resurrection, the Sabbath was on the seventh day of the week. But now, after his death and resurrection, it's on the first. This is what we see worked out in the New Testament. Since Jesus rose from the dead on the first day of the week, on Sunday, he has brought an end to the seventh day Sabbath and brought anew the first day Sabbath. We see his people gathering together consistently on the first day of the week where he appears to them. And in church history, that has been the practice. And so the principle of working six days and resting one is still in place. But now Jesus, as the Lord of the Sabbath, has moved it from the last day of the week to the first, where we begin the week resting and uh, rejoicing in God's work. So let me ask you this here in closing. What do your Sundays look like? I'm not going to give you a list of things that you must do or must not do. There is a, a list. It's relative. It's a short list, but we're, I don't want to do that now. I want to simply ask, are your Sundays set apart for the Lord? Is it a priority for you to gather with your church family for worship as much as you can? Do you make it a priority to spend time with other Christians on Sunday? Do you enjoy striving and, and seeking to, to rest, <laughs> oddly enough, but you spend time in God's Word? Do you spend time just unplugging from the onslaught of your phones and the world? Do you appreciate, do we appreciate on the Lord's Day that our Creator, our Redeemer, has given us great freedom He's not severe, harsh taskmaster, demanding us to work day in and day out, seven days a week, with no rest. Yes, God didn't take a nap when, after creating the world, but perhaps you should. Because we are finite creatures, and we need, we are body and soul. Have we committed with Isaiah to call the Sabbath a delight? Or does it seem like a burden? Do we primarily see it in restrictive terms? Or is it a day to spend on blessing other people? Or is it a day to spend serving myself? Is Sunday a day that you look forward to throughout the week? Look, we don't always, we don't wake up every Sunday morning just bolting out of bed. As soon as your feet hit the ground, you're like, I cannot believe Sunday's here again. But is it something that we genuinely desire, even though the flesh often is quite weak? Because here we have. Right? We, you can worship God every day of the week, but He has specifically given us one to come together every week, one day, each week, to devote ourselves to the consideration of our Maker and our Redeemer, to reflect upon the holy calling to which He has called us, to reflect upon our relationship with Him.
to reflect upon our relationship with one another, to think back to all that God has done for you in Christ, to think ahead to all that He will do for you in Christ, all that lies in store for you. Son, daughter, I pray that we would cherish the Lord's Day together, week in and week out, receiving it as the gift, the, the blessed and sanctified gift that God intended it to be. And we remember that we can only do that in Christ. There's no force of will, strength of mind that's going to bring it about, but it is running to Jesus Christ and entrusting ourselves wholly to Him. And in so doing, we find His rest and we can take great joy in experiencing a foretaste of that each week in the Lord's Day.